My name is Joshua Vettivalu. I'm an artist, um, cultural worker, administrator, educator, researcher, um, and probably something else that I'm forgetting. Hi there, my name is Mei Trong and I am a portrait photographer based in Toronto. Hi, hello, bojo. Wabagisha condition cause my quat no dam, wasak sink non chaba, and swakmak in dida. Hi, my name is Wabagisha Rice, and I am an author and freelance journalist. My artistic training started uh, at York University, where I went to go on to study. Um, sculpture and video, um, but I also did a minor in sexuality studies. Um, the sexuality studies program at York was really integral to my practice because it actually gave me um, the most concrete and meaty theoretical language to understand all of um, the ways in which the way I had been living through the world was actually very reactive to power structures that I couldn't name or I didn't know how to address. In a lot of ways, uh, I'm very glad that I studied something outside of just art um, because it really contextualized. It, it, it really gave me a sense of what images do in the world um, and how images are have actual very physical um, and real life effects for multiple people and how uh, my experience is just one of billions of uh, lineages uh, as part of that. When I first went to art school, I, uh, I wanted to be a, uh, either an animator or a figurative painter or drawer. Um, and I think there was something, something happened over the course of art school where I started to understand that um, my desires for creating hyper-realistic photo photorealistic um, renderings through the hand was actually like an ego investment of what has historically been seen as good art by not just a specific fine art population but by a general public um, and I think there was a real uh, I had to identify in myself like what was the ego investment there and not that it was a bad thing but I had to make a decision on if that investment was going to direct the rest of my creative practice. I started taking sculpture classes and video classes because I couldn't get into the classes that I want to, so it was kind of actually a fluke. But it started to kind of open up the world to me in a different way because I started to understand that there were just kind of lots of like like materials and symbols and like the things we reference visually all were kind of like fragmented utterances of an almost sentence um, and you know and everyone was bringing their own um, relationships to those symbols and materials constantly and then the mode that we do it through was language and so I started understanding that sculpture it was just like another vernacular for me to learn it, there all of a sudden there wasn't only one which was like you know uh, painting a, a real looking face. Um, all of a sudden, um, there was another language of sculpture, there was another language of video, there was another language of photo and graphic design. And so during my undergrad, I started to be like, oh, it actually might do good for me, who's not actually like um, technically proficient in all of these things, right? I was just kind of okay at everything. Um, but it kind of dawned on me, it was like, okay, you're not like the best wood carver or whatever. But at the same time, you're like learning and understanding this, and it might make sense for your career to learn as many languages as possible, op like open up my lexicon, open up my vocabulary, so that should a moment of urgency that calls me to make a work, like come forward or whatever, or an opportunity come forward, I have lots of different tools to address it. And so in art school, that started as specifically like in sculpture video land, teasing out symbols and materials, etc. But then as I, um, uh, you know, graduated and started working out into the field, writing grant applications and working for organizations and curating uh, and teaching, I started to understand that there were other languages like administration and, um, uh, social relations that also had a same physical world building effect. I'm currently sitting in my studio, 
which is a shared space in um, Little Portugal in Toronto. Um, we are a multidisciplinary studio um, full of like really awesome creative people. So there, uh, there's a whole like post-production facility, editing, coloring, sound engineering, um, VFX. Um, there are uh, cinematographers, um, directors, photographers, um, illustrators and animators who are a part of the space. Um, and it's really amazing to be part of such a, a really inclusive uh, mm, selection of artists and creators. Uh, so how did I get to where I am now? Um, I, I always knew that I wanted to be a photographer. Um, I wanted to work for magazines. I wanted to photograph musicians. Um, so I decided to go to photo school at Concordia University. And um, I hated it so much. I didn't come from an arts background, so I didn't have the vocabulary for, um, for all that stuff. And I didn't know how to use my camera. I didn't know how to use lights. Um, most of the students there were also like equally insecure. Um, I hated all of the classes that I went to. Um, I just, it, there was no diversity. It was really just like, oh, not, it, it wasn't a place for me. Um, so I decided to drop out and I went to uh, college. I went to Dawson College and did night school. I did a commercial photo program. And it was amazing because the students were between the ages of 18 and 60. No pretentiousness. Um, people just wanted to learn how to use their cameras and lights. And it was such a supportive space. It really allowed me the time to figure out like who I was as, an, as a portrait photographer. Um, I never really considered myself an artist until much later. I just thought that I was, you know, I just, I didn't consider photography an art form. Um, which, you know, it's just like, I do now, but earlier on, I just like, was like, I am not an artist, I am a photographer. Um, and so, what were the goals that I set for myself? I wanted to have an agent. I wanted to work for magazines and I wanted to do advertising. Um, and I was able to achieve all of that. And so I've gotten to a point where um, I'm really confident with who I am, with my work, with my voice. And it doesn't matter really what your um, medium is. It really is your voice that is your power. I'm a member of the Bear Clan of the Anishinaabek of Wissaxing First Nation that is on Georgian Bay near Perry Sound, Ontario, under the Robinson Huron Treaty. I currently live in Sudbury, Ontario, which is the traditional territory of Atikamekw Shing Anishinaabek, also under the Robinson Huron Treaty. So to describe my career path, um, well, I guess to describe a little bit more of my practice, um, I am an author of three fiction titles and I've had essays and short stories published in a number of anthologies. Uh, I formerly worked full time as a broadcast journalist, mostly with CBC over the course of my career. I graduated from Ryerson University in 2002 with a Bachelor of Journalism and over the course of almost uh, two full decades, I worked primarily in broadcasting but also freelanced as a uh, newspaper and magazine writer, and I spent most of my broadcasting career with the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation in cities like Winnipeg, Toronto, Ottawa, and Sudbury. I was a video journalist for most of my CBC career. That means I was a TV reporter who shot all my own images and then edited them for a supper hour broadcast on TV. And for the last little bit of my CBC career, I was a radio host. I hosted the afternoon program for Northern Ontario called Up North, which was based here in Sudbury and served the entire Northern Ontario region. So uh, I currently am working on my third novel, uh, which is the sequel to my 2018 novel, Moon of the Crested Snow. 
My earlier titles include the novel Legacy and the short story collection Midnight Sweat Lodge. I uh, grew up in my home community of Wasoxing with a pretty keen awareness of storytelling and the importance of sharing stories in the perpetuating culture and keeping it alive and keeping it strong. So sharing stories was always uh, very important to me. I took it very seriously uh, as a youth and I knew that it was what my ancestors did to ensure that our traditional ways stayed alive uh, in spite of the brutality of the ruling order, in spite of official bureaucratic measures to erase culture and identity of Indigenous peoples in this country that we now know as Canada. So I have greatly revered the practice of storytelling for most of my life uh, and I didn't really understand though how that could become a career uh, in a professional sense until uh, much later in my teen years. Uh, I went on a student exchange uh, towards the end of my high school career. Uh, I went on a Rotary International Student Exchange program to Germany back in 1996-1997 uh, when I was 17 years old. And shortly before embarking on that journey, I was uh, asked to write monthly reports or monthly articles about my experiences in a Northern European country as an Anishinaabek youth for a local newspaper in Northern Ontario uh, called the Anishinaabek News. And the Anishinaabek News publishes newspapers for all the First Nations under the Anishinaabek Nations. So roughly 40 communities across uh, Southern, Central and Northern Ontario. And that was my first exposure to journalism. That was really what showed me uh, the potential career path of journalism. And prior to that, I didn't really know that it was a viable career option for me, mostly because back then, as I was growing up in the 1980s and 1990s, I wasn't really exposed to any Indigenous journalists in the mainstream. Um, you know, the few who were doing crucial work back then, uh, I wasn't able to uh, see their work or be inspired by it. So as such, I didn't really believe that, uh, you know, journalism was for me. It wasn't even on my radar. And obviously I, br I blame the white supremacy in the system itself and, you know, not uh, properly reflecting uh, diverse communities in this country. You know, that is the nature of Canadian journalism. It has underserved this country by not reflecting it properly uh, since its inception. And those issues continue today. Uh, but through, I think, better representation and better use of imagery, uh, that is slowly improving. So going on this exchange program when I was a kid uh, got me onto journalism. Um, it's what inspired me to apply to journalism school. I decided to go to Ryerson in Toronto because I wanted to be in Toronto. I wanted to be in sort of the media hub of this country. And I was just very excited to be in the big city. So uh, that's how I got into journalism. Uh, in terms of uh, my literary career, um, I always enjoyed creative writing as a teen. It was sort of my hobby as I was growing up. I would go home uh, to the res after school and write out stories on a notepad with a pen just, you know, observing the funny, interesting and meaningful things happening around me. So I really knew the importance of documenting those experiences, although I never really imagined how that could turn into any sort of career either, because again, you know, I hadn't been exposed to the groundbreaking literary forces from Indigenous communities who were doing important work at that time. So uh, fortunately, I had uh, some family members, uh, one aunt in particular, who uh, exposed me to Indigenous authors back in the 1990s who were doing great things. And that inspired me to keep writing my stories. And uh, a lot of the stories that I wrote as a teen, I revised them in my mid twenties and they eventually became my first collection of short stories called Midnight Sweat Lodge, which was published in 2011.